If you ask random people who discovered America, you can be sure that almost everyone will give the same answer. Columbus, of course, who else? Many will give the date, 1492. Some will even recall the name of the ship, the Santa Maria. Thirty years ago, no one questioned this answer, but not today. Modern historians are brave enough to call the discoverers of the distant continent, and the Viking Leif Erikson, and Chinese explorer Zheng He, and the Englishman John Cabot. We, in turn, will try to separate fiction from reality. It is worth beginning with a few words about Columbus. On August 3, 1492, three ships, Santa Maria, Pinta, and Nina, left the port of the Portuguese town of Palos de la Frontera and set sail for the open sea. Two months later, on October 13 of that year, Christopher Columbus was the first European to set foot on the transoceanic land. He had seen it from his ship the day before. It was not a continent, but only the small island of San Salvador. Nevertheless, the fact remains. Columbus crossed the Atlantic Ocean and proved the existence of land to the west of Europe. On that voyage, the navigator also discovered the islands of Cuba and Haiti. He named the latter Española. The problem is that Columbus only landed on the mainland itself during his last fourth voyage. On the third, he explored the coasts of South America, but did not drop anchor. In fact, not even Christopher himself, but another member of the fourth expedition. His brother Bartolomeu Columbus, July 30, 1502 first set foot in what is now called Honduras. Thus, from the discovery of new lands to the formal step taken by a member of Columbus's expedition on American soil, almost ten years passed. Columbus's sensational discovery caused a boom among those wishing to reach the new continent, rumored to be rich not only in danger but also in precious metals. One of the adventurers was the English merchant John Caba. To be more exact, his birth name was Giovanni Caba, and he moved from his native Genoa to England only in 1494, aged 45. It was Caba who persuaded a guild of merchants to equip the first English expedition to Novaya Zemlya. By the way, one of the patrons who paid for Cabot's expedition was named Richard Emmerich. Some historians believe that the name America was given to the continent for this reason, and Amerigo Vespucci had nothing to do with it. On May 2, 1497 Cabot sailed from Bristol and in less than two months reached the island of Newfoundland, which is now part of the Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Characteristically, Cabot, like Columbus, sincerely believed that he had circumnavigated the earth and reached the east coast of Asia. On June 24, 1497, it was Cabot who became the first European to set foot on the land of North America. But again, not on mainland. The discovery of the mainland was clearly being delayed. A year later, on a repeat voyage, Cabot explored Baffin land in Greenland and saw the mainland line from afar and mapped it, but never landed on the continent. But Amerigo Vespucci turned out to be a more literate and lucky navigator although he was not even the captain of the ship that first reached the new continent. The captain was the Spanish Grande Alonso de Ojeda, and his expedition set out for the new lands in May 1499. They did not sail the beaten path for long, only 24 days, and already on June 14 they dropped anchor off the coast of Suriname. Vespucci served on the ship as navigator. In fact, both Vespucci and the pilot of the expedition, Juan de la Cosa, had participated in Columbus voyages. That is, it was not their first time. Ojeda was safely forgotten, mainly because he was ruthless, thirsty for profit, and had no interest at all in geographic discovery. On the second expedition, Captain Ojeda was revolted and returned to Europe in chains, while the cunning politician Vespucci took his place in history as the first man to set foot on the American mainland. With the support of the Duke of Lorraine, Rinigio, and a number of influential friends, Vespucci not only made a series of voyages to the New World, but also, in modern parlance, intelligently advertised them. Amerigo's name was on everyone's lips, while Columbus had fallen into disfavor and was in a difficult position. However, one cannot belittle the merits of Vespucci either. As an excellent navigator, he contributed to the study and mapping of much of the South American coastline. The only problem is that neither Columbus, nor Cabot, nor Vespucci were the first. The first were the Vikings.
The Scandinavian navigator Eric the Red was often in trouble. His father was expelled from his native Norway for murder, and the family moved to Iceland. Already there, young Eric himself had committed several murders and had also been banished. He could not return to his homeland, Norway, and was forced with all his household and servants to sail further west. Greenland in clear weather could be seen from the Icelandic shores, and Eric took advantage of this. After sailing about 300 kilometers, Eric landed on the coast of Greenland. Why he called the icy land a green country, no one knows thoroughly. Either the climate at that time was really warmer, or to attract other settlers. Three years later he was allowed to return to Iceland, but he made a different decision. Better to be a king in a new land than a mere Viking in an old one, wasn't it? He publicized the land he had discovered, and by 987 a town called Easterbait, Eastern Settlement, of 400 inhabitants, had been established in Greenland, which later grew to about 4,000. But it was Eric's son Leif Eriksson, nicknamed Lucky, who achieved much more. When his father was deported from Iceland, Leif was 12 years old. He grew up matured and, like his father, wanted to own new territories. That's why, around the year 1000, he listened to the stories of his associate Garni Herjolfsson, who had been carried far west a few years before. There he saw a certain land, and it certainly was not Greenland. Soon Leif outfitted a ship and set sail. Like Kebet 500 years later, Leif Erikson sailed to the island of Newfoundland and named it Vinland. However, this was his third voyage and the first two he discovered Labrador, Helioland, and Baffin Land, Markland. In Vinland, however, Erikson decided to settle down. The expedition brought cattle, household goods and tools, everything to establish a settlement. On the second ship sailed Leif's brother Thorvald. But there were problems with the settlement. Constant conflicts and clashes with the outnumbering American Indians, the original inhabitants of that land, forced Leif to abandon the idea of colonization and return to Greenland. However, more than once the Vikings sailed to the American territories for timber, and after Leif Erikson, another Viking, Thorfinn Karlsefni, attempted to settle in Vinland, but also unsuccessfully. Today, the stay of the Scandinavians in America is proven 100%. Both utensils and Viking clothing were found during excavations. This is where the real part of the story ends and fiction begins. After all, legend has it that the first Europeans in America were not Vikings at all. Irish saints are rather peculiar. While the canonized historical figures of mainland Europe mostly distinguished themselves by humility and martyrdom. The Irish were most often heroic, holding a sword, shield, or helm in their hands. Street Brendan of Clonford, in particular, was nicknamed the Navigator because he spent many years trying to find Eden beyond the seas. There are quite authentic moments in Brendan's biography. His birth in 484, his baptism at Tabrid, his taking of the priesthood, the founding of a monastery at Brendan Hill, there are dated entries in the monastery books describing these events. But around the year 530 the legend began. Brendan decided to go in search of Eden. He outfitted a ship with a crew. The number of expedition members varies from legend to legend, and sailed west. It is said that one of the intermediate points of Brendan's voyage was a landing on a huge fish, mistaken by the mariners for an island. The kindling of a fire awakened the fish and it sank into the depths of the sea, the travelers barely escaping. The episode with the fish is, of course, soldered in for beauty. But legends say that Brendan still managed to reach a certain Isle of the Blessed, which may well have been the coast of North America. At least on his return to Europe, Brendan spoke diligently about this island. For about 550, Brendan appears again in plausible chronicles, founds a number of monasteries, and finds his last refuge in the city of Clonfort in about 578. It is difficult to say whether Brendan reached America. In 1976, his supposed journey was repeated by traveler Tim Severin on an oxide courage, proving that it was theoretically possible. The only problem is that the life of Street Brendan was written around 1100, half a millennium after Brendan's journey. Many things could have been invented in 500 years. Tim Severin tested the veracity of more than just Street Brendan's voyage. Over the years, he repeated the route of Sinbad the sailor on the appropriate vessel, Jason's voyage on the New Argo and also Odysseus. All of his voyages were successful, and Tim Severin was much more likely to confirm the possibility of a legendary voyage than to refute the tale.
The last European discovery of the Americas occurred just 20 years before Columbus' voyage in 1472. Cartographers knew the Azores long before Novaya Zemlya. Already in the XIV century, well-drawn contours of their coastlines appear on maps, and from 1439 begins their colonization by the Spaniards. Around 1472, the Spanish navigator Juan Vaz Cort Real undertook a voyage west of the Azores and came across a new land near which there were many fish. He named the islands Terra Nova do Bacala, Nucat Land, and reported his discovery to the king, for which he was awarded an estate on the island of Tercera in 1474. The problem was that no one but Cort Real had ever been to Tresca Island. On one hand, it could have been Newfoundland, rich in fish, on the other, the coast of North America. After all, many believed that Court Real had completely made up the whole journey in order to get a reward from the king. Records of the voyage are very sparse. Only the names of the other sailors who sailed with Court Real have survived. Dieterich Pining, John Scolvis, Alvaro Martins. These are real people whose names also appear in other documents and stories. But Court Real's voyage remains a mystery, as does the island of Tresca. It is not only Europeans who claim primacy in the discovery of the Americas. An example of this is Abu Bakr II, Mansa, Sultan, of the Mali Empire of the early 14th century. In 1310, he succeeded his nephew Muhammad in Bao on the throne, but he turned out to be a worthless ruler. Abu Bakr's main goal was to explore the empire's maritime possessions. He questioned in detail all the sailors he could talk to, Egyptian, Malian, European, and outfitted a huge expedition. Each ship was stocked with food for two years to come. On board were experts in navigation, carpenters, merchants, jewelers, cattle. It was a whole floating city, almost 300 ships. In 1312, Abu Bakr's fleet sailed from the shores of Senegambia to the west, to the legendary land beyond the ocean. Mansa became Muzo'ai, and Abu Bakr never returned from his voyage. It is said that he did swim to America and stayed there. But excavations do not confirm this. In 2002, the Englishman Gavin Menzies published a book called 1421, The Year China Discovered the New World. It is not difficult to guess what it was about. Based on various historical and geographical assumptions, Menzies claimed that in 1421 the Chinese fleet, under the command of the diplomat and Admiral Zhang Yi, 1371-1435, reached the west coast of America. Zheng He was indeed a great traveler. Between 1405 and 1433, he undertook seven voyages of exploration for trade and foreign affairs in the service of the Ming emperors Zhu Di, Zhu Goji, and Zhu Zhanzi. It is well known that Chen He visited a number of regions on his voyages Champa, Java, Palembang, Sumatra, Ceylon, Calicut, East Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula. America, according to Menzi's version, was visited by a Chinese admiral on his sixth voyage which occurred in 1421-1422. There is no evidence for this fact, other than the author's logical conclusions. The book can safely be considered a fantastic reconstruction. In the end, America was discovered by Christopher Columbus. Why? The fact is that none of the previous discoveries, Brendan, Sinclair, Court Real, Abu Bakr, Zheng He, and even the very real discovery of Leif Erikson, made any tangible changes in the world, remaining mere curiosities. Suppose Brendan did indeed make it to America in the 6th century and even managed to return. So what? Still, no European monarch would have agreed to launch an expedition of small boats to an unknown destination based on the words of a mad monk. And the chances of those ships reaching America were negligible. The same goes for Abu Bakr and Henry Sinclair. America was only discovered for real when progress in shipbuilding and in human relations reached an appropriate level. Where Leif Erikson and a handful of kinsmen failed to establish themselves, organized and well-armed conquerors from European empires easily did. That's why we still don't say America was discovered by Erikson. And in any case, the northern peoples of Chukaka had long before Columbus crossed the Bering Strait to trade with the local population, and this is proven by archaeology. But for them Alaska was not a new land, but merely an extension of their own. And even earlier America was discovered by the Indians who had come here by the then-existing Bering Isthmus. 
anyone could have discovered America. Because America has never been closed.